So who thinks that was a true story? Yeah, good on you. Because you know that I always only ever tell true stories. Hey, I'm still traumatised. I can't hear the word Dawn Fraser without quivering. It was probably worse than I described. She, um, I actually was looking at her on Wikipedia um, this morning just to make sure I got all of my you know, gold medals correct in her times and records. And there's a whole story about how she stole a flag in Japan and swam across a moat or didn't swim across a moat and how she was banned from international swimming for six years. And like, yeah, she's a real character. Love her. She's the, she's the saviour of, of Balmain. And I, I hope in my mature years, if I ever got to meet Dawn, we could have a good laugh about it. And um, yeah, we would, we would still be friends. So who likes having a bludge at Easter? For those of you who are on the payroll, four days off at Easter is brilliant, isn't it? To sit at home on Friday and go, I'm getting paid to be lazy. This is, I think, something that we all aspire to. Or for those of you who perhaps are at the other end of the spectrum and you you know how to milk penalty rates, you think if I work Friday and Sunday and Monday, I get a week's pay for three days' work. It's brilliant, isn't it? For others of us, it's just an opportunity to tidy up the garden or go water skiing or hiking or perhaps to, um, yeah, sit down and and do a whole series of Netflix in a day. I don't know what Easter means for you. But for a few people within the Australian community, Easter still remains a time where our attention is drawn back to the event some 2,000 years ago where God became man and hung on a cross in order to purchase redemption and salvation for you and for me. Unlike Christmas, which is a pagan holiday reflecting the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere and borrowing heavily from the imagery of sun worship, Easter is actually celebrated at a time that occasionally coincides exactly with the Jewish Passover. And are you aware that this year is one of the years where last night was the Passover meal and today actually represents the day some 2,000 years ago where Jesus physically was nailed to the cross. We are on exactly the day when the crucifixion happened back there in the early part of the first century of Christianity. The Jews began their Passover week with a celebration meal that the Bible records for us was celebrated by Jesus with his disciples on Thursday night. And so I can imagine that right now somewhere around the world... There will be a young Jewish child who, like Lucy on the stage, wasn't she gorgeous? Jordan, um, Sarah, well done for producing such an awesome new citizen of the kingdom of heaven. But like Lucy, she would be chosen, this young child, to be the, the, the featured personality at a very, very special part of the Passover feast. And the youngest child at a Jewish Passover feast will be invited to ask four important questions. The four important questions of the Passover night asked by the young child begin with this saying, why is this night different from other nights? As part of the Jewish traditional way of celebrating the Passover, the asking of this question is perhaps the first significant act that somebody raised in the Jewish tradition will be asked to perform. It is their first spiritual opportunity to, 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 I guess, publicly declare that they are aligned with the values and culture of the Jewish tradition. The questions that they ask, part of a four-part interrogative, Um, was often put to music, and if you Google the internet, you can hear some very lame singing as, as people are teaching their children in nursery rhyme fashion. These four questions which form the introduction to the way the Jews recount the story of the Exodus. You see, because these four questions, when they are asked by this very young child, are never given direct answers. Instead, these four questions lead into the opportunity for the elders and those who who have positions of honour to recount to the younger generation in the passing of oral tradition why the Hebrews value the celebration of the Passover. 
And so this young child often in um, singing to a nursery rhyme will say, why is this night different from all other nights? On other nights we eat any bread, but on this night we only eat unleavened bread. Why is this night different from other nights? On other nights we eat any vegetables, but on this night we eat only bitter herbs. Why is this night different from other nights? On other nights we don't dip, but on this night we dip twice. Why is this night different from other nights? On other nights we sit upright, but on this night we recline. A good Jewish home will not give simple answers to these questions. Instead, these questions will lead to the recounting of the story of the Exodus as a way of saying to this young child, the story of the Exodus is key to our Jewishness. It is key to our identity. It is the identifying story that makes us what we are. Some modern Jewish websites take the mickey out of these questions and and make mockery of them. Others of them just say, I wish Grandpa's stories of the Exodus weren't so long. We're just hungry and we want to get stuck into our feast. But for the majority of Jewish homes where their religion is valued, the recounting of the story of the Exodus defines who they are as a people and helps them to gain an ingrained sense of identity. It establishes them in their culture and in their religion. And as a Christian who also values remembering the Exodus story, I'm really interested in the way the Jews recount their story. The book of Exodus emphasizes the urgency at which the Exodus took place. And as a Christian, and I read these four questions, I fully appreciate the first two. Would you resonate with them? Why is it that on all other nights we eat Various types of bread, but tonight we are eating unleavened bread. Of course, as as we journey through the the story of both the Jews and Christians, we see in it all of the the complex metaphors of leaven being a a, a metaphor of sin and rebellion and that the Jews even today will start a, a, um, a pursuit to rid their houses of all forms of leaven up to 14 days before the Passover. And the night before the Passover, they'll go through a very special ceremony where they will hunt for any last vestiges of leaven, to rid their house of any of the metaphor of evil and wickedness. But moving beyond the the, the metaphors of leaven being a a symbol of sin and how sin can weave its way and, and affect all that it comes in contact with, essentially on the night of the Passover, God said to the Jews, I want you to have your your clothes on, I want you to have your staves ready, I want your your sandals to be done up, and, and I don't want you to prepare an elaborate meal. I don't want you to go to all of the, the, the time and trouble of a huge feast. Instead, just bake some simple bread. Don't even wait for it to rise. The bread that you eat needs to be a bread of expediency and of urgency and give you the capacity at a moment's notice to just get up and run. And again, the vegetables, this is, this is not an opportunity for you to, to get into a, a festive mood and, and have a celebratory meal. Instead, the, the vegetables that I want you to eat, the bitter, the bitter vegetables, is, is marking a point in your history where this perhaps will be your clearest memory of the oppressive nature of the previous four centuries that you have had to endure while you are waiting for the Abrahamic promise to be fulfilled for you as a people. But when I get to those last two questions, I wonder why is it that the Jews celebrate the Passover with a variance on my image? God said to the Jews when when he was telling them how to celebrate the Passover, these are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals and carry your walking stick in your hands. Eat the meal with urgency. you, you, You can picture in your mind. This is at the, the, the climactic end of 10 plagues that have gone through Egypt and the hostility of Pharaoh and his armies towards the people of Israel is, is, is ramping up and ramping up and, and this is going to be the final showdown. And God says to his people, this is a camping meal. 
Yeah, this is, this is an expedition type meal. This is not an opportunity for you to sit back in festal robes and to celebrate. And so I'm interested, why in the Jews remembering the Exodus do they have the last two questions? On other nights we don't dip, but on this night we dip twice. Is there anybody here of Jewish background that can, can, can add weight to, to, to why this question is asked by a young child? If you believe that Google is the source of all knowledge and you have your appropriate filters on and you scour endless Jewish websites, you'll eventually come to the consensus that the reason that they do this dipping is because the Jews in celebrating the, the Passover are not merely retrospectively analysing the bitterness of the past, they are anticipating the brilliance of the future. And as a Christian, I like that. Do you like that? They were a generation of slaves that came to a moment in their history where bitterness would no longer define them. This idea about dipping twice, the first dipping was usually a potato or a, or, or a piece of celery or some kind of vegetable and they would dip it in salty water. And the salty water was representative in, in some sense of the tears they had shed under the oppression of the pharaohs and the rulers of Egypt of that bitter ethnic cleansing that was being carried out systematically by Pharaoh who recognised that the Jews being blessed by heaven above were breeding in fulfilment of the Abrahamic promise that the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would be like the sand of the sea or the stars in the sky. They would be without measure and without number. But the Abrahamic promise, while being pretty um, on the money in terms of the need for IVF for them as a people, was not quite on the money in terms of their location or their geography. They were multiplying for sure, but in the wrong place, and they weren't in their land. And so this first dipping has some sense of memory of the bitterness that they had as Pharaoh and all the armies of Egypt took them on as a people and tried to hold them in an oppressive um, circumstance. But the second dipping was instead dipping in a sweet mixture of dried foods and wine. This was a celebratory dipping. This was the dipping that said to the Jews, no longer bitterness, but now party. No longer poverty, now affluence. Rich people dipped their food. Rich people had their tables adorned with condiments and with, with the extras. Not in the simplicity of slaves' food. They were now participating in a part of the Passover that said to them, God's intention for us as a people is that we are not oppressed, but that we are living in freedom and in affluence. And the final question is an echo of the same idea. On this night, why do we do different to other nights? Other nights we sit, but on this night we recline. And God is saying to the Jewish people in their understanding of the way they celebrate the Passover that no longer would they be living like slaves. Instead, they could lie back and relax. They could chill in the presence that God had their back and the oppressors no longer had control over them. And as I think to myself, here we have a group of people who in the same ceremony are able to recognise the oppression but also anticipate the deliverance. I thought to myself, as Christians looking at Easter, sometimes we can get quite caught up in the graphic and, and, and terrible sufferings of the cross at the expense of the awesome privilege that is ours in believing in the resurrection. And I thought, I would like to have that same sense of optimism that I can effortlessly transition from the dipping of my vegetables in, in, in um, salty water, which reminds me of the sorrow and the tears, to the dipping of my food in the wine and the sweet fruits, which tell me that God has a new story that he wants to write for my life. And on this Easter weekend, as we focus with other Christians around the world, we can ask ourselves the question from a Christian perspective, why is this night different from other nights? What has God done for you and for me that helps us to live our new story? The Jews understood that the Passover was not merely a reflection of their bitter past, but an anticipatory celebration of the life to come. And I really like that, and I hope you do the same. 
For me, Easter, we can focus on the tortures of the cross. We can focus on the physical sufferings of Christ. We can, we can focus on the enormous cost and inconvenience that heaven went to to purchase our redemption. But the cross is only of consequence if there is a resurrection. Would you agree? Paul says without a resurrection, the preaching of the cross is in vain. Jesus did something that stands in history as a remarkable thing to do. He took on death and sin and beat it. That's awesome. That is why we are here today. We have a sense that God has done something that has enabled those who have been in the slavery and bondage of a taskmaster who wants nothing good for them to write themselves a completely new story, to see themselves with a completely new identity and move from bitterness to celebration. This is what the Easter story is all about. And so this morning, I just want to, for a few brief moments, ask myself the question, on this day, the anniversary of the death of Jesus of Nazareth, in anticipation of his coming resurrection, what, why is this night different from other nights? What is it about the event of the Passover that redefined Jewish identity for all time and perhaps became the clearest prototype of the gospel? Let's pick up the story at the burning bush. Moses has been under the watch care of Jehovah for some 80 years, saved from death at the hands of a jealous king. Moses has lived really in two radically different worlds. There is a part of him that remembers the Jewish traditions and Jewish songs and Jewish influences at his mother's knee while his mother cared for him as, as, as the foster parent of the, the princess who rescued him from the River Nile. And then at age 12, the Bible tells us that he was taken back into the palace of Egypt and he was schooled in all of the excellent knowledge, the military, um, I guess, commandership and, and, and the business principles and the economy and, and all of the learning of the Egyptians, Moses was given. And so you could kind of almost say that perhaps Moses is the first person in the Bible who, who, who is a little bit of a split personality. Is he Jewish or is he Egyptian? Can he be both? And when he turns up at the age of 40 to try and introduce himself to some of the fellow Hebrews as, as being one sympathetic to his cause, he finds that instead of a welcome embrace, he is despised by those that he has come to rescue. And in shame and embarrassment, he has run off into the, to the wilderness of Midian and for 40 years, those writing his biography could almost say 40 misspent years doing nothing other than herding sheep. But God was present and active in the life of Moses. Moses' story was on track. And at the age of 80, as he's out there in the desert of Midian, he comes near a bush and the bush is burning without being consumed. God introduces himself to Moses this way. I am the God of your father. Does that catch your attention? I am the God of your father. Now, it's a very um, technical, um, I, I guess, challenge to try and fully understand the Hebrew of this text. And scholars are divided as to whether the, the text should be more correctly rendered, I am the God of your fathers, and that's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, or whether God intentionally said to Moses, I am the God of Amram. I am the God of your father. Because I know that for you as well as for me, I have no troubles casting my mind back and seeing God as being an awesome God in the past. And I salivate and I get excited as I think about how awesome God will be in the future. But is my God big enough to be the God of the now? In Abraham's time, there were magnificent things that happened under, under the, the rule of God and the influence of God in Abraham's life. Armies were put to flight. Babies were born that never should have been born. Kings paid attention to him and invited him as, as a welcome guest at their table. Isaac and Jacob, man, Jacob could breed sheep any way you liked and they just kept multiplying and breeding and affluence and blessings just seemed to pour upon him. You could recount stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to your children, and they would all get puffed up chests and say, man, how God loves us. 
But I want you to picture for a moment that you are in the home of Amram and Jochebed and Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And the day-to-day grind of the oppressive taskmasters who are compelling you to work in the hot sun making clay bricks to establish a kingdom in another land for another king and another people. It was difficult. And when God turns up in the burning bush and introduces himself as the God of your father, he is saying in a clear way to Moses that I am the God of the now. I find myself wanting God to be the God of the now in my life. Would you agree? We, we really need as a church to pray for part of Pastor Peter and for Maisel and for Matthew. And I don't think in my entire life I've ever seen one family that has so much concentrated challenge at one point in time. Would some of you share the way that I feel? They have such a burden on their plate. And I know, having been a member of this church for some 20 years, that, that, that we have had moments in our life where we have pled with God for intervention for Nathan Thompson. We have pled with God for, for um, some of our, our members at, at, at Lismore. We've, we've witnessed um, just countless tragedy with Jethro and with other people in this church. And sometimes we can wake up and we go, God, you need to introduce yourself to us as the God of the now. Would you agree? It is not sufficient for us to know you as the God of history or anticipate you as the God of the future. We need you to be the God of the now. And I love this Passover story because when the burning bush happens, God turns up and he says to Moses, I am. I am. I want a God that will deliver me from the ATO and the NAB and the RMS and the ICU. Would you agree? I want a God who can be real in my story. But what does the Passover tell me about God? What the Passover tells me about God is that God has an impeccable sense of timing and it doesn't really matter at what point of history you find yourself interacting with God. God is not finished with humanity. And though at the moment he may appear silent and secretive, he is just as capable of being noisy and noticed. Would you agree? And the God of Amram says to Moses, I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress. I am aware of their sufferings. Does that provide you with some comfort? It may appear to all circumstances that God has forgotten us, that God is indifferent, that God is unaware. But God says to every generation, I have seen, I have heard, I am aware. And in the case of Moses, he announces himself and says, I have now come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. Why is this night different from all other nights? Because the God who had promised was now paying up. The Exodus story is in reality of an investigative judgment where God comes down to inquire, to see, to hear, to notice and ultimately to make a judgment on who is worthy of being delivered. As Adventists, we should resonate with this story because it gives us a picture of how God operates in judgment. Consistently in the scriptures, judgment doesn't occur because God needs to know more about us, but more because we need to know more about him. God saw, God heard, God was aware of every circumstance, of every story, of every need, of every hunger and of every longing. And God didn't need any new information. But the problem in the time of the Exodus is not that God didn't know us, but that we didn't know God. And so in due course, when Moses and Aaron present themselves before Pharaoh and say, this is what the Lord God of Israel says, let my people go. Pharaoh retorts and says, who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord. And I ask myself the question, was he unaware of the history of Egypt? Surely in History 101, as a young Pharaoh, he would have heard of the exploits of Joseph 
who with the blessings of the God of heaven was able to prophetically see that Egypt was bound for oblivion if it weren't for the fact that God had pre-warned them and they were able to stock up masses of grain through seven years of plenty so that in the time of suffering, Egypt became the powerhouse of the then known world. Surely Pharaoh was aware of that history. But I suspect that when he says, I don't know the Lord, he was being arrogant and pompous and was saying, I know the God of the Nile, I know the God of the fish, I know the God of the the, the ram and, and the cow, I know the God of the sheep, but this Jehovah, your God, he doesn't sit at my table, he's not in my story. This was a I don't know with contempt. Have you ever tried to hang around posh people? I, was, I grew up in kind of Blacktown. I'm a bit of a bogan, if that's something that I can boast about. And I can remember being with a bunch of posh people. I thought it was quite funny. I, I, I had an, a fellow academic who liked some of the stuff I was doing in the Aboriginal sector. And she failed to ask me whether I was Aboriginal and she nominated me for a, um, a fellowship that was really supposed to be given out to Aboriginals. And I won it. And I had to go down there to... Um, Sydney to be presented with my prize from the Governor Marie Bashir of New South Wales. And the room was just filled with posh people. And this posh person came over to me and she was telling me how she was just lonely. And I thought, oh, this fits right into my narrative. When you get affluent and rich, you lose all your friends. This is why God has blessed me with poverty, because he loves me. And you, you know the way we think about posh people. Like, surely they're all miserable. Anyway, she was telling me how miserable she was because none of her friends would visit her anymore. And I said, oh, why, where do you live? Oh, well, I've moved to the western suburbs. And I thought, oh, man, I live in Blacktown. Maybe she's a near neighbour. So I said, where have you moved? She said, Glebe. <laughs> now, for those of you who know Sydney, Glebe is like a rock's throw from Darling Harbour. She said, yeah, none of my friends will cross the Anzac Bridge. They're too scared. And I thought, posh people, they're just a puzzle. Her posh friends would not cross the Anzac Bridge because that's where all the Bogans lived. If you got on the other side of Darling Harbour, that's, you know, people were poor. And, and I thought, wow, posh people can be so despising. And, and you try and hang around them and saddle up and, you know, oh, I was actually touched Craig Lowndes or got a signature from Vettel and now I'm with all the posh people. And, and I can just imagine Ella Webb at some race in Monaco, screaming out, hey, Vettel, do you remember me? You signed my thing for me seven years ago when you were racing in, I don't know, wherever it was that Ella got his signature. I think she's got it twice, hasn't she, Gary? Melbourne? Yeah, at Melbourne. When you were at Albert Park, remember me? You go, Ella Webb, I don't know you. Ella Webb thought she was going to marry him when she was young. I don't know you. This is the kind of thing that Pharaoh is saying about Jehovah. I don't know him. I've got no connection with him. I don't acknowledge that he is significant. And so I want you to pay attention that in this prototype of biblical judgment, judgment is not so much so that God can find out about Pharaoh, but that Pharaoh will have a true opportunity to find out about God. Would you agree? It is not so that God could find out about the children of Israel as much as it was the children of Israel could find out about God and make a conscious decision that this night will be different from all other nights because on this night, God has shown us what he is truly like and we have come to appreciate him. I am the Lord, I will free you from oppression, I will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt, I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. God put himself on trial in the ten plagues because he wanted to catch the attention of every kindred, nation, tongue and people and invite those who would be loyal to him to put themselves under his uniform and under his banner. Why is this night different from all other nights? Because on this night, God will roll up his sleeves and he will actively begin to separate those who acknowledge him from those who won't. 
Pharaoh knew the God of the river. He knew the God of the frogs and the lice and the flies. He has statues everywhere to the God of cattle, the weather, the harvest, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And through a succession of increasingly intense judgments, Pharaoh has an opportunity along with the entire nation of Egypt to recognize that this Jehovah who he has just despised and shown contempt for is actually the winner in every contest and the clear ruler of all nations. Why is this night different from other nights? Because on this night, Jehovah has clearly submitted himself for examination and has been found to be exonerated. Those who are pretending to exist without a need of acknowledging his presence or power have been found to be fools. And when we as Christians, anticipating the final judgment, speak of the hour of his judgment, let us keep in mind that the final act of judgment is primarily there to exonerate God and not us. Can I say that? The primary purpose of judgment in the Bible has always been to exonerate God and not us. We are consequentially the beneficiaries of the exoneration of God because there is no clearer way than God can come off looking shiny than to rescue those who have put their faith in him. But before you get all anxious and worried and terrified that the judgment is going to end up badly because your track record is less than impeccable or you haven't got your stuff all together, recognize that the judgment is brilliant good news because it is primarily God who is on trial. God will win, and if we are smart enough and have enough faith to affiliate our lot with him, then we will win with him. We sometimes, in our attempts to soften the idea of judgment, pretend that it will never happen, or that it has already happened, or that it will never happen again. But in our church, the Adventist church, we cannot read the book of Revelation and be comfortable with any of those ideas. Our marching orders, our mandate, the text that gives us our identity is the fantastic good news that God is on a mission to rescue and to redeem, that he has earned the right to be our redeemer, our rescuer, our restorer, because he created us and he loves us and he is invested in our story. He is worthy of our worship. We ought to give our attention to him as the sole entity of worship. And as Adventists, we need to recognize that we are living in a moment in this earth's history where God is giving all men and women an opportunity to either align themselves with him or separate themselves from him. The final act of judgment remains difficult for me to fully understand. And in the time of the plagues, when Jesus, God came down to to say to Pharaoh, tonight the firstborn will be at risk unless you clearly make a mark on your doorpost that you are on my team. I I shudder. I, I find it very difficult to understand this act. But in some sense, if you understand the culture of the day, God had taken on the God of the river. He had taken on the God of the flies. He had taken on the God of the locusts. He had taken on the God of the sun and the moon and the stars and the cattle. And he had shown himself in every way to be superior to that God. And within the framework of that culture, the firstborn son was the person who was responsible for the spiritual direction, the economic success, and and, and really, I guess, the identity of that family network. And when God said, you need to decide whether the person that is setting the course of the story of the next generation is aligned with me or without me, he was really, I guess, setting Egypt up for that final decision as to where their loyalties would lie. God said, on this night, I am going to pass through the land of Egypt and I'm going to strike down every firstborn son and every firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. All those that claim authority, all those that claim influence, all those that claim power can only truly fulfill their destiny and their role if they are first subject to the king of kings. And if in our lives we have positions of responsibility and influence, then let us recognize that we will best fulfill our duties when we bow low before the King of Kings. 
Aligned with Christ, we cannot lose. Separated from Christ, we cannot win. And now in this final act of judgment, all had opportunity to demonstrate their loyalty and their identity. Jehovah said through Moses to Pharaoh that on this night I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt and I'm going to strike down every firstborn son, every firstborn male. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, but the blood on your doorstep will, will serve as a sign marking houses where you are staying and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There is a way of escaping the judgments of God. And that is to be clearly under the blood. There are a thousand sermons we can preach, but as I wrap this up, there was just something that I found reading through Jewish websites that I found intriguing and interesting and a concept that I'll leave with you as we pull this together. Why is this night different from every night's? Because on this night, God will know who is on his team and who isn't. Back in the day, the Egyptians had this idea that the afterlife was very, very important to them. And everybody's houses and palaces, even those of the kings, were made of mud brick, something that was transient and temporal and could be destroyed by, by storm and rain and wind. When they built their tombs, their, their sarcophaguses and their tomb rooms, they would be built out of marble and stone and something that was much more enduring. And the lintels over the doors, doorposts of, of most Egyptian houses were built of something more solid and more enduring than the mud brick which formed the rest of their homes. And they would etch and inscribe onto the lintels of, of, of their doors the family name. And for those of you who are uh, familiar with archaeology and have looked at some of the various pharaohs and, and pharaohesses that existed, you'll be aware that in moments of history, when there were competing dynasties and competing factions, that the new faction would often find the tombs of the pre-existing pharaohs and they would chisel their names out of the rocks and chisel their names out of the marble. Are you aware of that? And it was as if to say that if we can eliminate your name from the permanence of the stone that bears the inscription of your memory, that we will compromise you in the afterlife. And so this act of taking blood and going to the lintel of your door and finding your, your family's inscription and covering it with blood, it was as if to say that you were prepared to lose your own individual identity and in essence, in Egyptian thinking, sacrifice your hope of the afterlife and instead be branded with the blood of the lamb. You were giving up your individual identity and you were throwing your lot in with Jehovah who has said, hide your name and put my brand above your door. And as I think to myself, when Jesus says to us, if any man would save his life, he will lose it. But if any man will lose his life for my sake, then he will find it. God is inviting us tonight, this day, why is this day different from every other day? Because we are willing to lose our own brand, our own identity, our own kingdom, our own fame, our own fortune, and we are to say that we are branded with the blood of Christ. Is it a nice metaphor? Does it, does it have some essence of truth in the gospel? You know, I worked in the Aboriginal Medical Service for many years. And the closest thing to religion in the Aboriginal medical service is a game of football. And I could nearly tell how old somebody was by asking them who their favourite team was. If somebody, let's say for example, that the Bulldogs won in 2006, if I asked someone who your favourite team is and they said the Bulldogs, then I would say that they're probably born in 2002, because when the Bulldogs won the Premiership they were four or five, and they pick the winning team as their favourite team. Does that sound right? I, I like um, American football. Some of you will laugh and mock, but I find it an intriguingly interesting game. And I um, like seeing all of these people who can do physical exploits that I can only dream about, running around the field and throwing balls and catching them. I, I, I find it an intriguing game. But it's no surprise that my two favourite teams are the New England Patriots and the Denver Broncos. Why? Because they were in the NFL Super Bowl the year my interest was tweaked with American football. As humans, we tend to want to identify ourselves with winners. Is that correct? 
was hard being a New South Welshman for a decade or so when Queensland won every state of origin and turncoats like Tebony sitting down there, even though she lived in New South Wales, would cheer vociferously for Queensland. And her excuse was very lame that she came from Victoria and when she got to New South Wales she could choose whichever team she wanted or something like that. I'm probably telling the story wrong but I think it's close to that. We like to be associated with winners, would you say? But I want to picture you for a mo you to get ahead in your picture for a moment what God was asking these Jews to do. He says, I want you to sacrifice a lamb and I want you to take its blood and I want you to paint it on your doorstep so that I clearly know that you're on my team. Now, if God was winning, this was brilliant. But what if God didn't win? Would you like to live in a street with other Egyptians who thought that sheep were sacred and they despised shepherds and anybody who would sacrifice them would arouse the hostility of the whole street against you. Would you like to wake up in the morning and go, yeah, pick me. Here's my house. It's got blood all over it. God asked the Jews to put a sign on their door that they had chosen sides before the final showdown. This says something to me about judgment. God doesn't want us to pick winners in hindsight. God wants us to pick the winner in anticipation. There's a big difference, would you agree? It's very easy to pick the winner after the event. But who wants to wake up this morning and say that my favourite team in the, I don't know, NRL, who's losing this year? I've kind of lost interest in it. Losing interest in cricket as well. Um, what are we going to do? Let's all watch American football. They're full of righteousness. <laughs> When Moses turned up calling for a separation between the followers of Jehovah and the followers of Egypt, Egypt was tyrannical in their treatment of the Jews. Instead of giving you the straw, you go out and collect it. And if you don't meet quota, we'll beat you. There was recent case history to tell the Jews that it was not a bright idea to upset the Egyptians. And when Jesus gave this command to sacrifice a sheep which was offensive to the Egyptians, to take the blood and brand it over your own identity and to give signal to the people around you that you were clearly on God's side, this was done at great risk. And saints, let me say this to you in closing. We live in the hour of God's judgment and this is not a time to play it safe. Can you say amen? This is a time for us to be bold, not offensive, not irritable, not annoying, but to be bold and to be confident and to say to God, we are not ashamed to be labelled as on your side. Why is this night different to other nights? Because this is a night on which you need to decide who you have the greatest respect for. Are you interested in courting the favour of your neighbours and the cultural commentators of the powerful and popular? Or have you found that God is worthy of your worship and without shame decided to give him your loyalty? This is the time for us to make a decision. We don't get the privilege of picking the winning team from a position of hindsight. God has submitted himself for our examination. And if we read history, if we read the scriptures, if we read the testimony of those who have found him faithful, there is sufficient evidence for us to say in times when it may appear to be at great personal risk, I am on God's team and I believe that he will win. You know, after the youngest child has asked these four questions and after the story of the Exodus has been recounted, the Jewish family sits down and eat the Passover meal and they are aware at that moment that there is a spare seat in the room and does anyone know who that seat is for? They are waiting for the prophet Elijah. At every Passover table, there will be a spare seat waiting for the prophet Elijah. They want to see the forerunner of the promised Messiah. They still long for the deliverer to come and answer all of their Passover dreams. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, says that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And as Christians, we see in Christ the fulfillment of every messianic dream. Jesus has turned up on time. He has rescued, he has redeemed, he is restoring, he has sacrificed all for us. Why is this night different from other nights? Because we have compelling reasons to believe that 
that judgment is here. The gods of this world compete for our attention and those in positions of power and authority are more often than not indifferent to the claims of God. We will not be saved if we sit under our own banner and our own label. But if we are prepared to boldly put the blood of Jesus on the lintel of our door and on the doorposts under which we dwell, then we have been promised that God will fulfill his promise to be faithful to us. He will spare and deliver us. We need to be alert. We need to be ready. We need to give up on the idea that we can live our lives at a measured pace, filling it with all the luxuries of life without crisis. We need to remind ourselves of the bitterness of slavery and sin and the bitterness of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. But we also must not forget the joy that awaits us. We must be prepared not only to dip our food in the salty water of our tears, but to dip it in the luxurious um, joy of, of, of the best of the fruits and the sweetest of the wine. We need to recognize that God has called us to recline in peaceful trust that he is awesome and that he will give us a new story. Christ's blood has given us a new identity, a new story, and a new hope. And if you want to thank him and honour him, then I invite you to stand with me now as we sing our final hymn. Father God, at this moment, where around the world people are remembering your death and your resurrection, give us the confidence to believe that you remain faithful that you are the God of our generation, that you are alive, living, active, aware, seeing and hearing, and that the promise of your deliverance is about to burst forth into our time and space. And Lord, as that happens, and as the hostility of those that oppose you is ramped up, may we be fearless and bold in our confidence that our lot will be the best under your blood is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.